Good morning. I think it's time to start. I guess someone will join in, uh, during the... <laughs> as expected. Uh, thank you for coming. No, no way. Thank you for coming, uh, especially because this is a, a, a particular hour. I mean, it's in the, in the afternoon and the Saturday and uh, on other tracks that are very, let's say, important people like uh, I'm Professor Tannenbaum, so thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Luigi Dell'Aguila. I work at Orient Technologies, that is the company behind OrientDB, the multimodal database. There you can find my Twitter handle if you want any additional information about my speech, about my work, about the product, or anything. Just um, send a message, a private message there. I'll be happy to answer. All of your questions. Today I'll talk about reactive, let's say reactive programming. Well, actually it's not, uh, it's not like that. I mean, I'm not only talking about programming, but I'm talking about reactive systems. Uh, from data to the user interface, passing through architecture components like Node.js. Some years ago, I. What's going on? Oh, this one. Okay. Uh, some years ago, I started studying reactive programming. I met uh, reactive languages, like, I mean, uh, languages that are particularly uh, good for that, like ACA or like uh, functional, pro uh, functional languages in general. Uh, so many models uh, that fit very well with the, the, the reactive paradigm. Uh, well, actually, I work uh, in the database field. So uh, I, I, at the beginning, I started thinking about how uh, my layer, so the data layer, could fit into this model. Uh, I mean, I, I'm a programmer, of course. I'm a, I'm a director on consulting at Orient Technologies, but I'm also a core developer and a committer in, uh, in the Orient DB. So I, I, I write code every day. Uh, so I started from reactive programming. This is the definition from Wikipedia. Reactive programming is a, a programming paradigm oriented around uh, data flows and the propagation of change. What does it mean? Uh, I highlighted a couple of keywords here. Uh, reactive programming, we'll see why. Uh, data flows, I mean, data is not about programming, data is data. Uh, and propagation of change. I'd like to start from the last one, uh, just to explain what we're talking about. Suppose you write a code like this in, a, in your favorite programming language. A equals to one, B equals three, and then C equals A plus B. You expect the result like four. But what does it happen when one of the former values ch changes? I mean, when A becomes two, what does C do? Does it change? Does it remain four? Does it change to five? Uh, this is the point of propagation of change. I mean, in a uh, classical programming paradigm, uh, imperative and procedural, uh, you expect it to be constant. I mean, you expect C to remain 4, while propagation of change is exactly this. Uh, it's pushing changes between connected entities in many ways, in a synchronous way, uh, especially. So, just to, to give you an insight of my initial feeling about all this. Then I asked myself this. So it's about programming, isn't it? Well, I started reading the Reactive Manifesto. Maybe some one of you uh, who uh, in this room, who knows Reactive Manifesto? Well, some of you, right. OK. Uh, Reactive Manifesto says that reactive systems are have this um, active, act this way, let's say. Uh, they're responsive, they're resilient and elastic, and they're message-driven. Uh, but, well, this is not about, uh, about programming, actually. It's 
the manifesto says act reactive systems. So it's more general. And if you look at these points, you see that responsive is something that involves user experience, for example. So uh, that responsive does not mean that when, when you change the, the size of your device, the, the CSS adapts. That means that uh, you have a, a fast response to, um, to actions on your user interface, for example. Uh, you have uh, quick answers. Uh, elastic and resilient. Uh, resilient means that uh, in front of a failure, the system doesn't fail as a whole, but it resists to this failure and adapts. Elastic, you know wh what it means. It means that when your uh, load needs change, when you have um, spikes of load on your system, the system just adapts, just scales up or down with your needs. And message driven, this is really strange because this is not about system, this is not about the architecture, but this is more about a paradigm. Um, Programming paradigm, maybe, yeah. You can write uh, a message-driven uh, program. I mean, you can with, with uh, message libraries and so on. But this is a, a way of interacting between components. So that's OK. Uh, so it's about systems. Uh, and now my, my answer starts becoming more, I mean, starts to, to make more sense. Uh, it's not only about programming. So. My field, database field, is inside all this. So also a database has to act as a reactive component in a reactive system. So I started thinking about, at the beginning, in the very beginning, I started thinking about reactive applications. Then I saw that a reactive application has to be responsive, uh, looking at the manifesto. So there's more, there's user interface and user, user experience involved. That's something that is. Uh, at, the, at the border of the application. I mean, there's the user involved. But there's also data. Uh, remember the definition from Wikipedia. So there's also database involved in, in all these. And there's a whole system all together as an architecture. So uh, components that work together, middleware and so on, and the whole architecture. Uh, and it has to scale. It has to be elastic. Uh, so. Maybe it has to work in multiple instances. It has to, to scale up also horizontally. So uh, I, I, I don't want to take too much time in uh, explaining all the concepts. I, I'm not an, an, an expert in uh, uh, reactive programming in general. Uh, this talk will be uh, focused uh, about how uh, OrientDB fits in a re reactive stack. And I will use uh, well-known components like uh, Node.js and um, Socket.io that are components that I like particularly. Uh, these three components to, to, to do a very simple, uh, a very simple architecture uh, and a very simple application to Socket.io, what's this? Uh, who knows that? Who knows Socket.io? One, two, three, four, five. Well, Say ten people, okay. Second, so uh, is a is a library uh, that enables real-time bidirectional event-based communication. Uh, it's designed to be cross-platform and to work on browsers, on mobile devices, on uh, many platforms, uh, focusing on reliability and speed. So, uh, how does it fit into the uh, reactive manifesto? This is event-based. This is more or less uh, message driven. I mean, it's based on events. You can think of a, a message as an instruction of an event. And it's focused on the reliability and speed. Remember, uh, reactive uh, UI and reliability of the system. Uh, then there's a Node.js. I, I think everybody of you knows uh, Node.js. Node.js is a platform um, built on top of the Chrome's JavaScript runtime engine, and it's designed to easily build uh, scalable web and network applications in general. Uh, it uses uh, event-driven paradigms too, uh, so no blocking IO model and so on. So it perfectly fits with, with all this. Uh, well, OrientDB, here I can spend a couple of words more. How many of you know uh, OrientDB? 
okay, more or less the same number as uh, people who knew um, socket I.O. The strong, the strong difference is that in that corner of the room, uh, a lot of people raise their hands and they uh, can answer why they, uh, a couple of them work at Orient Technologies, so, <laughs> so it's, it makes sense. Anyway, um, it's, I have to spend a couple of words about, it, about this, not only because I work for this company, but also because, I mean, uh, otherwise I don't know uh, how, I, how I can make it fit in the architecture. OrientDB is a Second generation distributed multimodal database. Uh, that definition is from the website. It says that this is a graph database. Actually, OrientDB is a multimodal database. That means that it has a, a document database, a graph database. It also has uh, object oriented con um, concepts and it has. Um, features that are not proper of uh, no SQL databases like SQL support, so you can execute queries in SQL in OrientDB. Uh, it's got um, an architecture that is uh, intended to scale horizontally with full replica or sharding, so um, distributed deployment of the, of the database. Uh, it's released uh, under an open source commercial friendly li license that is Apache 2 license. That means that you can download OrienDB from the website, the community edition of course, and use it in your application without uh, paying not even a cent to, to Orient Technologies. This is free for, for any usage. Uh, OrienDB has got some uh, particular features that make it fit very well into the, into the model. Um, one of them is an internal feature that is the ability of reacting to um, data events like insert, update, delete, and so on uh, in, a, in a very fine-grained way. You can define something like triggers that are called hooks at a single record level, and you can manage this, kinds, this kind of events in well-known languages like JavaScript or Java. So you can write your triggers in JavaScript and then let the trigger uh, fire on only a single document. So if you have two, three different documents or two, three different vertices in the same class, or in DB doesn't have tables, it has classes, uh, they will fire different triggers. So now we will see how it fits in, the, in this architecture. Let's start. Uh, what's the aim of this technical, of the technical part of this talk? We will write a, a fully reactive chat in 30 lines of code, nothing more. Uh, well, actually, I stole 90% uh, of this code from uh, a Socket.io website. This is uh, uh, something you can find. I mean, uh, the, the part that involves Node.js and uh, yeah, Node.js and Socket.io uh, is copied paste from the Socket.io website, so nothing new. Uh, but the database part is something uh, really new. Uh, I, I don't want to say new, I want to say uh, bleeding edge, because it will be released in next days. It's still a little bit unstable. I mean, it's not in the official release. Uh, you will see that also to try that up, uh, uh, you, you need a couple of hacks. Uh, OK, let's create our application. Um, Creating an application in Node.js is very simple. Just create a JSON file, call this package.json. Right inside uh, this file is a snippet of JSON that is the application name, version of the application, and a, a small description. And a dependencies block, empty. That's, that's OK. And that's it. Then open a terminal, move to that directory, and uh, you need npm installed, of course, you need Node.js installed. Uh, you have to download it from the website and install that on your machine. And type these two comments, uh, npm install save uh, express at version number, and npm install uh, socket.io. Uh, the first one, express, is a, a component for, um, for an enhanced HTTP capabilities, web server capabilities of Node.js. So I use Express.js just to intercept simple uh, HTTP comments from a browser and to dispatch um, HTML pages and, uh, and comments. That's it. Uh, so just type these two comments in the console, and you're ready 
to go. Now, uh, after you do that, I'll move to something you will like more. Uh, bzz, 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 here it is. Okay. Um, now you can just create your uh, your scaffolding. You just need two files uh, into the uh, into the. Uh, the demo folder. The demo folder is where you uh, you, we, you created the um, the package JSON file. Now here you just have to create an index HTML and index JSP file, empty if you want. Uh, the first version of these files will be more or less like this. So uh, hmm, I don't like this. Okay, better. So and uh, uh, of course some style sheet, but nothing peculiar. Uh, here I put just put a, a UL tag where I will send my chat messages and then a little form at the bottom that will where I type chat messages with a uh, submit button. Nothing, nothing more. Uh, about the JS file, I just do this. I read a couple of things for uh, these of you that don't know uh, Node.js. Uh, I'm using require to say import. I'm a Java developer, so import is part of my slang. Uh, I import a couple of dependencies that are express, as I told you, and HTTP, that is the uh, HTTP capabilities of uh, Node.js. Then you just uh, say app.get slash and a function. Here uh, you're doing, you're starting to do something that is uh, actually the, the, the beginning of Reactive. You are, you are declaring a callback on an event. This event, this message comes from the browser. So any URL that is sent from the browser, slash means everything, um, will be intercepted by the express layer and will be dispatched to this callback. So with request and response objects. If you know serverless and things like that, you know what I'm saying. And I do something very simple. I do response, send file, directory name, that is current directory, slash index HTML, nothing more. So I created a simple um, web server with four lines of code. And I say HTTP listen on port 3000, nothing more. Uh, if I start this application, and I'll do this like this, just uh, in, uh, I imported the application into WebStorm. Uh, this is useful because you, you have code highlights, you have many hel helps <laughs> on, the, on the JavaScript side. But if you want, you can start the application from the command line just typing node index, uh, index.js, enter, and the application just starts. But I will do this from here. Right click, run, and the application starts. The application has already started. So let me open a browser and see what happens. Localhost 3000, remember the, the address. Here it is. This is my chat. Nothing more. That's empty. Uh, the, the, um, the web server just dispatched the, um, the, H the index HTML file that is just this. Here you have the form with the send button and, uh, and the empty part uh, at the top. Nothing more. Okay, let's close this one. This is okay. Okay, we can stop this and go uh, looking at something more, say, I don't want to say complicated, but let's say useful. Uh, now, uh, you can start uh, adding some logic to your application to understand why uh, and when your, um, your client is joining. The, the server and is connecting with something active. So we start to involve um, socket IO. I the first thing I do is importing socket IO. Uh, that is just this var IO requires socket IO AA and I pass the HTTP handle over there. And then I add a couple of lines of code here. IO on connection and bind the callback. This callback function just says um, send a log on the console when a user uh, connects to to the um, when a client connects to the to the server application. So uh, this is intercepts when on a client another uh, socket IO instance tries to communicate 
on the client side of Ozone, so on the, on the browser side, you will have something like this. You just import, uh, here it is, okay. You just import Socket.io, I copied, uh, and Socket.io is in, the, in this folder. Uh, it's copied there when you do this. Mm, it will do the job. When you do this in the mm, in your application root directory, you obtain something like this. You obtain a node modules folder subfolder with Express and Socket IO. So you see, they are just copied. The source of these libraries is just copied into your application. This way, I just import that in the in my web page, and then I say. OK, start using Socket.io. And this is enough. Uh, when the application starts, uh, Socket.io asks on the server side if there's something uh, listening for an active connection. And this something that is listening is just this one. It's just this. It's connection on. So on, it means when, s when some Socket.io is connecting, invoke this callback. So every time a client connects, a, cons a log is, lo uh, is uh, printed on the console, nothing more. So easy. I just established the connection between the live connection. So something like a web socket from the client to the server. It's very easy. OK. Third step, something more. I mean, let's start doing something real. OK. Uh, no, let's start from the web page. Here it is. Uh, I just imported also jQuery because uh, I, uh, it's useful to manipulate uh, the, the DOM. That's, that's it, but that's not useful for this thing. That's just for convenience here. And then I start adding some more logic here. Um, using uh, jQuery, I just bind uh, a callback function to the submit action on the on the form. You know, you remember the the, the chat form where, where I uh, write um, messages. I bind the socket. I ask for socket to uh, so to socket IO, and then I emit a chat message with this value. This value is just the value of uh, the, the this one. You know the ID of this input. If you know, um, how many of you know jQuery? I guess everybody. Oh, that's nice. OK. So you know very well what this means. Take the value of uh, that input and give me back the value. Uh, this call is just emitting a message, an asynchronous message, to the Socket.io on the server side, nothing more. And then I just add the message. So uh, I'm adding my current message to, uh, to a list that is here. So I'm just displaying on the chat, uh, on the top of the chat, the list of the messages I'm writing, nothing more. But the, 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 the big part of the, of the communication is this one. So I just emit uh, a message to the server. And the handle of this message is chat message. This is something I choose. I'm free to do that. Uh, on the server side, I do a little bit more of what I did before. Uh, before, I just had uh, IO on connect and console log. Now I add the socket that is the, the callback um, input parameter. Uh, I use socket.on chat message, do something. So I receive a message from the client. The handle of that. Uh, message is chat message. I defined it on the client, and I bind a function that takes a message. The message is just what the, s what the client is sending, so this one. I receive the text I wrote, nothing more. I just log it into the, into the console, nothing more. So, uh, let's see if it was here. Uh, no, it wasn't. Okay, well, okay, so that's it. Uh, actually, this is, this is enough to say that uh, we already have 
half of uh, reactive stack. I mean, I am eating messages on the client. These messages are transparently sent uh, to the server, bind, bound to a handle, and there's a callback that is invoked when messages arrive. And everything is completely transparent. Uh, now I just had to have I just have to add another little step. I have to add uh, some logic to send these messages to other clients. I mean, if I have two chats open, both have to receive the message. And this is as easy as doing this. That is, on chat message, emit another chat message. That's it. So emit to the clients another chat message. And the clients just get this. So socket on chat message, display append another li with the text of the message to the messages block here at the top of the of the page. So on the server on the client side, I do an emit. Oh, this is a little bit small. Let me enlarge it a little. Okay. On the client side, I do an emit, and on the client on the server side, I have a, a on chat message that received the message does another emit, the same, but on the server side, and the client receives an on chat message and displays the messages. Let's see how it works. Let's start it again. Play. Oh, this. <laughs> I'm used to Java applications that take a while to start. This is immediate. <laughs> OK. So here it is. Let's open another chat and see what happens. Oh, OK. Here it is. So, as usual, uh, localhost 3000, localhost 3000. OK, two chats. One is too big. Let's reduce a little bit, OK? Hello. You see on the other side. Yep, here I am. You see, nothing. Couple of lines of code, nothing more. Messages, asynchronous messages that uh, fly from the client to the server, from the server to the client, f with a single API that is emit, so send a message, that is a standard. I mean, if you know a little bit Node.js, that's, that's the same, you just do an emit. And on the other side, the same. On a handle, invoke a callback, nothing more. Um, so the same code, the same thing you, you do from the client to send a message to the server, you can do exactly the same to send a message from the server to the client. Identical. Now, uh, OK, that wa this was nice. Let's close something here and start from scratch. I want to do something more, something nicer. I want to, uh, so, so this is my application right now. I just emit messages and I receive messages that are emitted again. Now I want to add another component, that is the database. Now, how can a database interact with all this? Uh, if I want uh, a chat, maybe I'm interested in the history of the conversation. So I, in general, I'd like to save my chat messages to the server. I'd like to have my clients to be able to uh, query on the database for the history, the chat history. Uh, I can do something more. Uh, I can also change, or at least use the database as a collector of flows or information. Because I don't know if message, chat message, I mean, if the database is the collector of my chat. Uh, maybe I have a Node.js application that sends messages to the database. But maybe I have a, a console program that does insert into the database. And maybe I have a, a mobile application or a standalone application that is connected to the database and adds records or deletes records. Now, I'd like the database to behave exactly as the rest of the application. <coughs> as you can see, here, nobody asks. Everybody pushes. So when the client has a new message, it pushes the message to the server. When the server has a new message from a client, it pushes the message to the other clients. So I don't expect the server to query the database. That's a pull operation. Give me select star from. I don't want to pull information from the database. I want the database to send me the information when that's available. And I don't want to ask for that record. I don't want to ask for a, a chat message by, uh, by a primary key, for example. 
I want to ask for a particular kind of records. Let's say I have a chat table that in ORNDB is a chat class, because I don't have tables, I have a class. Uh, I'd like to do something like select star from class, and if somebody adds new records into uh, this class, I want the database to push data to the client. And this is what we do here. Uh, you need a little bit uh, of architecture added to all this to, to achieve the result. Uh, this is just a code. You will find it in the, in the slides. This is what I show you until now. Um, of course, you have to install the database. Um, this, what, what I'm showing you now is in, ex in an experimental branch on GitHub. This is public code. This is free open source. Uh, if you want to try it out, you have to check out uh, to, to clone uh, this, uh, this repository from GitHub and just uh, type this in the console and clean install. You will have a, uh, a folder, a build folder with the database ready to be started, nothing more. Uh, when it's on the official release, that is in a, a few weeks probably, probably um, you will be able to download the, the ORNDB from the website and just unzip and start, nothing more. So this is what you have to do to install ORNDB. Uh, you also have to install another component that is called Oriento. Oriento is the ORNDB driver for Node.js. Uh, how to install Oriento in, uh, in your Node.js application? Just npm install Oriento. The real problem is, this, is that this one is the official version and it doesn't support uh, live query at this time. So you have to do npm install from my <laughs> GitHub account. You have to, to take the Oriento branch with live query support. Have a little patience. It's, this is bleeding edge uh, technology at this moment and it will be available in a few a few days or a few weeks. So just npm install this one in, inside your application folder, of course. And that's it. No, I don't want to show you that code. I, I, want, to, I want you to see it in the, in the application. So uh, when you do this, you just have uh, another, oh, here it is. In node modules, you will have an Oriental folder that contains Oriental libraries, so the, the driver. Now let's start the database. Uh, here it is. Okay, first question, how, uh, how do I have to install and start OriNDB? CD applications, OriNDB releases, I have it into OriNDB community 2.1 snapshot. Uh, bin, here it is, server.sh, done, OriNDB is running. Okay, let's see what's inside here. Uh, when you open ORNDB, let's enlarge it a little bit. Okay, here it is. Uh, log out. Here it is. I created a, a database that is called test. This is the database we will use in the demo. You just have to log into this and say admin, admin. This is ORNDB Studio. This is the web console uh, that is integrated into ORNDB. And here it is. Here you can do queries like select star from V, V stands for vertex. I told you that ORNDB is a document graph database. So as a graph database, it has a vertex class and edge class. So V is the, um, let me, oh, okay. V is the vertex class that is a default class. I will write chat messages there for being easy. Okay, that's empty at this time. Now, let's see what the applicate, the, um, oh my. Okay, here it is. Let's see what the client has, um, I mean, the, 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 the client of the database has to do. Uh, let's open another snippet. Uh, now when I, uh, I don't want messages only to come from the, uh, first of all, I want to write messages to, to the database. And I can do this easily. Um, again, a little bit. Uh, okay, here it is. Um, when I receive a, mess, a chat message, instead of sending it to other clients, I write it into the database with db.query, insert it into v, set message equals a parameter, and then I pass the parameter message equals, equals the input message. Nothing more. I do an insert operation into the database. And then I do the smart thing. I register a live query. <coughs> so I do db dot live query and, s and say live select from v. So give me everything that happens 
into the V class. Here I can add uh, a where clause, for example, where, uh, I don't know, message.length is greater than 30 characters. I don't know. So I can filter the results. And then I register callbacks on live events. Live events are uh, insert, update, and delete. So uh, crude operations on the database. So I register on live insert with a callback and on live delete with another callback. The first callback just does an IO emit chat message. And I send the content, the, the mess this message attribute that is into the content package of, of this data. Consider that data is an envelope, content is a, a document that contains the changed document, and the message is an attribute of this document. With ORNDB, I can use dot notation to uh, traverse embedded document. That's like, this is like JSON on the ORNDB side. So every time someone uh, inserts an uh, something, a record, into the V class, I get notified and asynchronously and a callback is invoked. Let's see what happens here. Uh, let's take this one. Let's copy and paste in the right place. OK, Control A, Control V. OK, or in the B has started. OK, let's start again. This is ready. OK, local host 3000. OK, now uh, if I write a new message, I will explain you. Ah, hello. And I get a hello. What does it happen here? The client, I mean, the, the web page does this. It sends an emit, a chat message to the server. The, ch the server intercepts this message with the on chat message, and it saves the, the, the message on the database. So I'm not sending anything to clients. Uh, <coughs> On the other side, on the database, when the insert happens and the insert matches this query, I have a, a callback. That means that I have an insert operation. This callback is invoked, and I emit a chat message. This chat message is also sent to the client, so th the client receives that. Now, the nice thing is that if I do, I don't know, uh, insert into v set message equals this is from the DB. Here it is. I did an insert operation in the database, and I got the result on the, on the client. So how many lines of code? Look at this. 30 lines of code. Nothing more. This is huge. If you think about this, uh, writing an application with this potential is really um, it's really huge, especially when you, uh, when you have languages that have this paradigm. Think about Akka, think about uh, reactive programming in Node.js, or uh, other uh, languages that use this paradigm. But do you remember, uh, that's not enough for me, uh, do you remember the elastic, resilient, and so on? How can uh, I achieve this elastic, resilient, and so on with a database? With a replica. So you know, I have to scale up with writes, I have to scale up with read operations, I have to scale up in general, and I want fault tolerance. I don't want a, a single point of failure. I can start ORNDB in a multi-master configuration. So I can spawn multiple nodes of ORNDB, and they will work together to have um, uh, synchron full synchronization and communication between them. Can be, that can be synchronous or can also be asynchronous. And then I can build a stack like this. I can have asynchronous calls from the browser that goes to Node.js, that does an insert here, that does an asynchronous communication to another node, that does an asynchronous communication to Node.js, that does an asynchronous communication to the browser, and I get the messages. Now, if any of these goes down, the other one will be ready to intercept and to reconnect. On the, on the clients, on the um, drivers, or in DB drivers, there are uh, mechanisms that just uh, know the topology of the network and just re re-execute operations transparently um, in front of a failure. So you have full uh, reliability on this, on this side. Now, I'd like to show you this because it seems that uh, it's, uh, it's something, you know, uh, rocket science, but uh, let me close this one. OK. Oh, let's throw everything down and start again. Uh, I stopped ORNDB. 
I have to start in another way. I have to start a, a D server. I'm telling this node that is a distributed node. Okay. It starts and it's this. Now I called this node node one. I wrote it in the configuration, but it's trivial. Now I just do CD applications or NDB releases or NDB uh, node or NDB, but replica. This is another folder bin. This server. Now I can, how can I let two nodes join together? Nothing. Just start the server instead of server. They will uh, discover each other on the network with a multicast call, a multicast HTTP call, no, nothing more, and they will just join each other. You see? You see a couple of blocks. Uh, now we will see something that says that. Uh, oh, can I hear this? Two members. Oh, lost. <laughs> Too late. Uh, here it is, two members, they joined, they joined on two port, different ports, of course. So the first one is listening at 24, 24, uh, 34, the second one on 24, 33. They also have two different HTTP ports. So here I have the 24, 80. I can open another one on 81, 24, 81 port. This is uh, the second node. It asks for a password, of course, admin, admin. And here it is. And if I do select from V. On a node, I get two results. I can enlarge it a little bit, OK. Then I can take the other one and say, insert into uh, set message the third. OK. And if I do a select from V here, I get the replica, the third, this one. So everything is completely synchronized. Now, let's restart my application, my um, my Node.js application, here it is. Okay. Oh, I did a mess. Okay, here it is. Uh, uh, local host, local host, here it is. This is the chat. Now, this is connected to the first instance, so to this one. Now, if I do an insert on the other instance, so I simulate another client with an insert into v set uh, message equals, here we go. Nope. Here we go. Here what happens is I insert on a node, the node replicates to the other node, then the other node sends the asynchronous message to its clients and everything is completely aligned. Uh, you know, uh, it seems like magic, actually. It's, uh, it's something we all need today. This is what the market is asking for and also the other players in the market are doing the same. So, um, we, uh, w we at Orient Technologies, we are doing what has to be done at this moment. Uh, s if you want some resources, uh, what, what's the time? I have uh, 15 minutes, I guess. Okay. A uh, couple of resources about Orient DB. Uh, this is the Orient Technologies website if you need uh, the free product, so free open source product, you can find the download from there. If you need uh, consultancy or uh, enterprise services, Orient Technologies <coughs> also provides enterprise services. This is the public repository of Orient DB. Here in under or, uh, GitHub Orient Technologies, you will also find the repository of Oriento and other, other uh, clients. Uh, and this is a free online training course. If you want to learn the basics about Orient DB, here you can find a, a free resource for that. There's also documentation in the, uh, in the official website, of course. Um, as I told you, this is uh, Apache license. That means that it's free, open source for any usage. You can fork this project. You can contribute to the, pro to the project. You can uh, use the project, uh, the OrientDB, in your projects. And I mean, this is like if it's yours. Any questions? <coughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you you have to enforce uh, uh, many. Uh, yeah, yeah. Of course, some of them have to be uh, enforced. Uh, uh, yes, about data injection. Yeah, you have to to enforce some constraints, some checks on the on the application side. Some other checks are made at the at the server side. Just consider that ORNDB has got a, a strict <coughs> policy about. Uh, authorization and authentication. Uh, you have. Uh, uh yeah. 
Yeah, you, 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 you can. Yeah, yeah, of course. There are, there are many. You, on, on, the way, on the Socket IO website, you will find a lot of uh, information about Orient DB. Uh, you have record level security, so you have uh, secure connections. You have many things about that. Okay. Performance. Performance. Uh, all the components are um, designed to be, per to be performing. I mean, for the live query. Live query is uh, an, uh, an asynchronous. Uh, mechanism. This is performing just because it relies on a, on a low-level mechanism in the database. Uh, that is hooks, regular-level hooks. <coughs> so, uh, to give you uh, an order of magnitude, uh, every time you insert a record into the database, the database checks for security rules. So uh, if the user can read the record, can write the record, is if the user has the, all the permissions. And that's uh, implemented with a hook that is like a, a, a trigger on the database, but it's written in Java. Uh, the live query is implemented with the same mechanism. It's a hook in the database that just filters data, sends uh, them to a queue, so that that's decoupled from the database performance lifecycle. And on the other side of this uh, queue, there is a, a pool of threads that just evaluates conditions on the live query and sends data around. So the basics uh, of, the, of the mechanism are at, are at the low level in the database and don't uh, impact performance very much. Any other questions? Okay, I, I think I, I think we have time to to talk about ORNDB a little bit more. Uh, ORNDB has got a, um, a very complex model. Uh, I told you ORNDB is not a uh, graph database. ORNDB is not a document database. ORNDB is both, and is it's even more. So when you define um, a data structure in ORNDB, you define a class. You can define a class person, you can define a class student that extends person, and you can do polymorphic queries on these structures. So you can do create class student extends person, <coughs> insert student records, and do select from person and get also students. Just to give you an idea. This is one of the features. Uh, ORNDB works in a schemaful, schemaless, or schema mixed mode. That means that you can define a class with attributes or without any attributes, and then you can store whatever you want in that class. Whatever you want means new attributes, so you can do something like this. Um, let's see. Create, uh, let's enlarge this. Create class foo. Here it is. Flat. And then I can say insert into foo, oops, foo, uh, name, surname, Values, you see it's SQL, um, I don't know, bar, bus. That's it. I never declared that the full class has name and surname. But I can do this. The, the database not even doesn't complain, but gives me the record. If I do select from foo, I get the result. Here it is. Uh, so this is schemaless mode. I can also work schemaful, so I can define property names and property values, and I can define indexes and constraints on these properties. So single property indexes or composite indexes. Um, I can have simple properties, so strings, numbers, and so on. I can have embedded documents as properties. So I can have documents that contain documents that contain documents and so on. I can have collections and map properties. So I can have a list or a set as a collection value. Um, this is the document model. Now, every document has got uh, a record ID that is made of a cluster ID and a cluster position. These two information are physical information about where the record is into the storage. A property can also be a link to another document. So I have a link, I, I can have a document that links in a property to another document that some like, something like a pointer. So if you want to traverse these pointers, you don't have to do a join operation. You don't have to do uh, an index lookup, for example, because you have the physical pointer into the, into the property. So the traversal time is constant time, is O1, not O log n, for example. And this is huge when you have big data. If you have billions of the records, 
look, a lookup in an index can be expensive. This thing gives you the best performance even on big data. The graph API on top of the document API is just an, an abstraction. You have documents that represent vertexes and documents that represent edges that connect that are connected together. Traversing the graph just means traversing links at the low level. So traversing a graph is a, uh, a constant time operation. It's a very performing operation. Uh, again, um, OrinDB supports SQL, more or less. But of course, it's a graph database, so it needs something uh, more um, sophisticated. So for example, uh, Maybe you want to traverse in depth a graph, and you don't know how deep you want to traverse. Now, together with select, ORNDB has got a traverse operator. That is something like traverse out friend, uh, no, from person, I don't know, from, let's do something more uh, meaningful. Select from person, oops, from person where name equals Luigi, for example. So start from me, from Luigi, traverse the friend relationship, I don't know, while depth is less than 10. So my friends, friends of friends, and friends of friends, and return all the traverse path. And here I can write whatever I want. I don't know, depth is less than 10, and uh, I don't know, age is less, is greater than 18, I don't know. So I can do deep traversal with a simple API. And this is plain SQL. You have and, or, not, um, functions. You can extend the query language with JavaScript functions. I don't know. Uh, look at this. I'm defining a new JavaScript function that is upper. Upper. That is a JavaScript function. And that just takes a parameter that is name, and I do return uh, name to uppercase. I only hope this is the right syntax in JavaScript. I never remember the case of this function. If I do this one, let's try it. Luigi, execute. Oh, error, here it is. <laughs> no, no way. Is it? Save, execute. Here it is, I got Luigi in uppercase. Now I can use this function to e enhance my, um, my query language. So I, I can do select from foo, select name from foo, but I can do select upper, oop, sorry, per name from foo. It gives me the uppercase value. I can also use this function as a web service, like uh, localhost. Uh, here it is. Uh, TV, here it is. Function, no. Uh, function test um, upper Luigi. No. What's this doing? I hate Chrome sometimes. No, it, it, it just complains. I don't know why. Maybe I'm... Ah, get mail is not allowed. OK. Oh, functions. I have to say that this method is idempotent. Otherwise, I have to call this in post. Save. What? What are you doing here? Upper. What's going on here? I don't know. Ah, OK. Like bugging studio. And I get Luigi in uppercase. So I'm exposing my functions as a web service, uh, as a REST web service. Um, it's got a lot of potentials. You have record level security. That means that you can, des you can decide uh, that this, a particular record has an owner. So the user that creates a record is, becomes its owner. And if two uh, users do the same query, they get different results, and everybody just gets its own records, for example. And then you have, of course, uh, full replica, sharding, functionalities, um, a lot of things. About what? Uh, about uh, performance of, of um, plain operations is uh, more or less 
the same of the state of the art, yeah. Let's say on some use cases, on flat table, maybe relational is faster. On connected data, this model is much, much faster. On deep traversal, with this model you can do that, with another model you can't. Um, yeah, and yeah. There's a native, uh, yeah, on, in Oriental there's a native API that is uh, a fluent API with calls to build queries. There are drivers for almost every language, Java, JavaScript, Python, PHP. The, where's the, the contributor? Maybe the, the what's the, oh, here he is. He, is, uh, he wrote the, the, the PHP and Python drivers. That, that other guy um, deserves a, a, a thank you for, for the big help he did on live queries because we did it together. So he also needs a, um, a big thank you. And again. <laughs>